Because you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space. We have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle function. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome today's keynote speaker, astronaut Mike Mullane. As a child of the space race, Mullane grew up to realize that rocket fuel ran in his blood. A graduate of West Point, Mullane was commissioned in the U.S. Air Force and flew 134 combat missions over Vietnam as a weapons systems operator. Mullane was selected in the first space shuttle astronaut class and has flown three missions into space, including the maiden voyage of space shuttle discovery. Listen, your work up there is helping to make it easier for the people of the Earth to communicate with each other, so on top of being spacemen and a spacewoman, you're doing some very good work for your fellow citizens of Earth, and we're very thankful and we're also very proud. Back on Earth, Mullane has summited some of the highest peaks on the planet, including the tallest peak in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro. Join him now on an out-of-this-world journey, certain to lift your team to new orbits of safety and success. We have a go for main engine start. Buckle up for a ride you won't soon forget. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mike Mullane. We have liftoff, the first flight of the orbiter Discovery, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Well, folks, uh, Max and Max's Models here, and we have a very special uh, opportunity here today to talk with three-time shuttle astronaut Mike Mullane. And uh, since uh, you guys came here to listen to him and not to me, I will hand it off to you, Mike. Okay, pleasure to meet you here in cyberspace, Max. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mike Mullane. I'll, uh, I'm going to be giving you a life story here shortly, but uh, I thought what I would, I know uh, Max sent me a list of questions that you had about being an astronaut. I thought I would uh, preempt some of these questions by just going over my, uh, what it was like to launch on a shuttle, some sights you see from the window, and then talk about my life story, how I ended up being an astronaut. And then I'll let Max fire the questions to me uh, beyond those that I might answer in this program. And we will uh, just finish up with those. So let me share my screen here and we will launch off with these, this narration of, uh, Got to get the right one here. Yeah, here it is. Share from beginning. There, okay, got it. You got it. All right. So uh, let's uh, vicariously, let me take you into space vicariously here. Let's pretend we're all astronauts. We awake about five hours before liftoff. They schedule a brief breakfast, but good luck bringing an appetite to it. Uh, in fact, good luck getting any sleep the night before a shuttle launch. You've got a few things on your mind here. Uh, around three hours before liftoff, we'll walk from the crew quarters, climb into the crew van, drive to the launch pad, take the elevator to the cockpit level, exit that, walk across the access arm. What do you think your heart rate is right here? I guarantee it's going to be choking you. You're going to feel every beat in your throat. Uh, we enter a white room at the end of the, gant of the access arm where we're dressed in our harnesses, then we get down on our hands and knees and crawl into the cockpit. There'll be technicians inside that will help lay us back into our chairs. They will strap us to those chairs and then as they leave, they will close the side hatch, the access arm will be retracted and we will be left alone. And while we're awaiting launch, we're gonna be in the grips of two fundamental emotions, one of which is fear. Uh, you will fear for your life while you're out there, but at the same time that fear is on you, you're gonna be boundlessly joyful because for most astronauts, it truly is a lifetime quest to make this flight and with that at hand, we're going to be overwhelmed with joy. Now, at T minus six seconds, the three liquid engines start. When that occurs, we get this, <clears throat> we get this heavy vibration in the cockpit. At T zero, the hold down bolts blow. There's four hold down, explosive hold down bolts on the skirts of each of these solid rocket boosters that are fragmented apart, releasing the vehicle. Simultaneously, the boosters ignite, and we're slapped into our seats with a force of about two Gs as the rocket leaps from the launch pad. At two minutes and 12 seconds up, the boosters burn out and separate. And when that occurs, we hear a loud bang. We see this whip of fire across the windscreens as these boosters are explosively separated. And then we continue into space on our three liquid fueled engines, burning liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen out of that big orange gas tank. 
Eight and a half minutes up, the autopilot shuts off the engines, the gas tank is empty. It was jettisoned, all that remain now headed in the gas tank burned up in the atmosphere. All that remain now uh, headed to orbit was the winged vehicle. Uh, we called that the orbiter. And now we're on our way to the International Space Station, a place I never visited because I left NASA in 1990 after my third and last shuttle mission. First piece of the space station did not get launched until eight years later, 1998. Okay, let's uh, look out the window of a shuttle and see what we can see. First of all, we do not see the Earth like this from a shuttle or from the ISS. Uh, the, the, this photo was taken, this iconic photo was taken by astronauts uh, tens of thousands of miles from Earth uh, coming to or, or going to or coming back from the moon. Uh, when we see, we look out the window of a shuttle or an ISS, uh, you're very close to the Earth, a uh, couple hundred miles up, anywhere from about 130 nautical to about uh, close to 400 uh, uh, miles. That's, that's where we orbit. And so it's very close. It fills the windows. Uh, we can see the Earth is curved, but we can't see it as a disk as the Apollo astronauts did. This is a great view of the Mideast right here, Cairo, Nile River, Red Sea, Saudi Arabia, Israel over there, and there's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, your horizon on a shuttle is about 2,000 miles away. Most of the time you look out the window though, <clears throat> excuse me, you do not see landmass. You see water. Uh, the Earth is a water planet, and so most of the time that's what you're looking out at, water and clouds. A lot of it's ice. This is Greenland right here, which was clearly named by a real estate developer. Not a lot of green down there. Uh, this is the Aurora Borealis. Uh, looks like green fire hanging in the sky. Beautiful to look at. It's about, that's occurring about 50 miles altitude, and you're up, a, as I said, around 200. So you're obviously looking down to see that. Uh, this is lightning flashing way on down on the ground, another beautiful phenomenon to watch, as are city lights. Those are the white blobs you see there. This video was taken over the Gulf of Mexico, looking north <clears throat> into the southeast part of the U.S., so a blob of lights, top center Atlanta. Now over to the right is Jacksonville, and across the belt of Florida from left to right, you see St. Pete, Tampa, and Orlando. Uh, again, very, very beautiful to look at these night sights. Uh, this, I'm going to stop, stop the video here. Hold on a second. Stop the video here. Uh, this video that I'm going to play is, uh, was taken by a special low light level camera on the International Space Station. And the video, uh, and it's a film of the city lights uh, of the terrain over the Midwest and upper Midwest and into Canada as the ISS uh, made a track across that area. Uh, now, we do not see the level of detail with the naked eye that you're seeing in this video. These I would see the light, the big blob of lights, bottom center, the lights of Kansas City. You're certainly going to see those, but you're not going to see a lot of those little dots there, those towns and hamlets uh, in small, small towns. You're not going to see those. Uh, now, the video runs probably, I'm guessing, about four, four times or so faster than it would appear if you were actually aboard the ISS. So I'll let it play at uh, the speed and kind of narrate quickly what you're seeing. And then I have a, a still of it and I'll show you some of the cities. So there goes the lights of Kansas City. Now coming up, going bottom center right here are the lights of St. Louis. You see Chicago, Lake Michigan, Detroit, Lake Erie, Toronto. Then you're looking at Ottawa and Montreal. Uh, again, just gorgeous, look at those lights. Uh, here is a stop action. There's Lake Michigan, Chicago. Uh, you're looking at Lake Erie, Detroit, Cleveland, Columbus, Akron. Some of you might be from those, uh, from that area. By the way, that green you see in the horizon area, that's the Aurora Borealis too, looking up to the north. That's what you're seeing there. Uh, let me talk about my missions. My first mission was 1984, the first flight of the Orbiter Discovery, the 12th shuttle mission in the series. We had three of these uh, communication, spinning communication satellites to release uh, on that particular mission. Let me let me tell you, and there were some questions about this, on my first launch attempt in uh, June of 1984, yeah, should have shut that off, clear that off my screen. Um, the, uh, let me go back here. On the first launch attempt, the three liquid engines start six seconds early so they can be checked by computers and shut down if there's any problem. Uh, in the 11 previous missions uh, leading to mine, the engines started past all their checks and the rocket flew as I described uh, in that narration. But on my particular mission, when the engines started, one of them malfunctioned and the computers commanded in what they call an 
an RSLS abort is what it's called. But at any rate, uh, it shuts all the engines down and you don't fly. Uh, unfortunately, on this particular, this is the first time that ever happened, which we had trained for, but still really get you when you're sitting out on 4 million pounds of propellant and have these things ignite and get that heavy shaking in the cockpit and then have dead silence. But then what really got our attention is the word fire. The ground reported seeing a fire at the base of the vehicle. Now that will get your attention in a big way. Now we can't see anything that's going on here. We're totally blind. We have to depend on mission control. Uh, for a while though, we thought, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, we were gonna have to do an emergency escape from the launch pad. And if we, ha we did not have to do that, we stayed in the cockpit and they, they got us out the normal way. But uh, this is what we would have done. And we practiced for this uh, before our launches, all crews did but you would run across, the access arm would be swung back in place. You would run across that access arm, jump in these, these launch baskets, release those. They, they would slide down on a, on a quarter mile wire and you would jump out of the baskets and hide in an underground bunker to wait out whatever the problem is on the, on the launch pad. We did not have to do that. Uh, they turned on the fire suppression system and got the, the fire out and we uh, exited the, the normal way and we came back uh, a couple months later, they fixed the engines and we came back for my first shuttle launch aboard Discovery in uh, August of 1984. Uh, you, you might wonder, <laughs> I remember sitting on that launch pad when those engines shut down and I was scared. I looked over at Steve Hawley, the mission specialist who was sitting next to me and he looked at me and said, I thought we'd be higher when the engines quit. And I didn't think there was anything funny at that particular moment. <laughs> Some people can find humor and I guess other situations. Uh, my second mission was a classified military mission, but I did use the robot arm to release a military satellite into space. That's all I can say. It was not this satellite. This is Hubble Space Telescope. I just use this as representative of what I did in, in, the, in the act of using the robot arm to, to release a satellite. But that was, in, that was the second mission after Challenger uh, flown in 1988. In, uh, in December of, of, of 1980, excuse me. Uh, yeah, December of 1988. And uh, the, the problem, uh, just, we, we had a very narrow escape on reentry with this, um, with this particular mission. Uh, during launch, the tip of the right side solid rocket booster broke off. And that, uh, uh, the debris from that, that solid pieces on that tip of that solid rocket booster shotgunned our heat shield and severely damaged about 800 heat tiles. Uh, before the rocket flew again, they had to change out, I think, I think it was around 700 heat, heat, heat tiles. What really bothered us though was the fact we were missing one completely in a very high temperature area of, of re-entry up, up in the nose area. And uh, in this particular case, we were aware of the damage that we had sustained uh, because we had a robot arm, the ground saw and the cameras that we had taken the debris hit and they sent me the directions to use that robot arm, bend it in a crazy angle to, to reach over and, and survey the area they thought had been hit by this debris off the booster. And we could see that damage, we could see this missing tile and it really, really uh, was a concern on reentry, knowing that you're coming back with a, with a wounded vehicle basically. Uh, now the engineers assured us that even with one missing tile, uh, the vehicle would not burn up on reentry. Uh, of course, it's easy to assure people from lab tests and wind tunnel tests when you're riding the rocket, it's a little bit different. Um, but by the way, uh, you know, this is what this uh, damage to a heat, heat uh, tile, to the heat shield is what doomed Columbia when it burned up over, over Texas in 2003. And, in that particular case, they did not have a robot arm, so they were they had no uh, no exact view, no no direct view of the damage they had taken, and so they mission control made a decision that again they had seen the the hit with cameras from the ground, but their models said that uh, their computer models said that where the hit occurred and the size of the debris, it would not cause a problem, which obviously proved wrong. Uh, in their particular case, it hit the leading edge of the wing, which is covered with a very brittle heat shield uh, called uh, carbon carbon, reinforced carbon carbon, punched a hole in the leading edge of the, of the left wing about uh, nine inches in diameter. And that's a very high temperature area. That's almost 3000 degree heat on reentry. So 
you had a nine inch hole in the leading edge of the left wing, it allowed the heat to come in, melted off the wing and uh, destroyed the vehicle and the crew was lost on, on reentry. Had they had a robot arm and surveyed and seen that damage, just by happenstance, there was another shuttle on the launch pad getting ready for launch. Uh, the, the reviews said that after the tragedy, they, they said had they known, they would have been able to hustle up getting that vehicle ready for launch, sending that up to rescue the crew and abandon uh, Columbia in orbit. Uh, unfortunately, they did not have the knowledge of how severe the damage was though. Okay, a little background there. Well, uh, STS-36 was my last shuttle mission. Again, it was a secret military flight that I can't talk about, but that was, uh, the, the, uh, that was my last mission in, in 1990. I left NASA after that. Uh, let me give you my career path to the astronaut. Uh, I was a West Point graduate. I uh, took my commission in the US Air Force and ended up, I wanted to be a pilot, but I could not be a pilot. My eyesight was poor. So I ended up flying in the back seat of the RF-4C uh, RF Phantom uh, jet. It's the reconnaissance version of the famed F-4 Phantom. Uh, we carried uh, cameras up in the nose to uh, film enemy, enemy targets. And uh, that's what I did in 1969 in Vietnam. I was flying in the backseat of the RF-4 over there. We would fly very low level, high speed over enemy targets uh, for pre-strike photography and post-strike uh, post photography. And I continued after Vietnam, stayed in the Air Force. I was uh, four years in the NATO forces over in Europe, flying out of a base in England, Alconbury Air Force Base, still with the RF-4C. Uh, there we would, our mission was to, if the, we ever had a war with Russia, we would be doing flights, taking pictures of Russian targets. Uh, I don't know how well that would have wor worked out. Uh, but anyway, thank God we never had a, a war in Europe. Uh, following that, I went to graduate school, got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. I uh, was fortunate enough to get selected for the backseater course of test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base. That has the same academics as, as the pilots go through, but obviously the, it's a different flying uh, as a, what they call a flight test engineer versus a test pilot, different flying uh, instruction. Uh, from there, I went to Eglin Air Force Base where I was doing weapons testing uh, on, in the F-4 and in the uh, F-111 fighter bomber. Love that airplane, beautiful airplane, swing wing fighter bomber. Uh, sitting up front there on the left side of the, uh, excuse me, the, the right side of the cockpit, the, wizard, the uh, back seater sat next to the pilot on the right side. So you weren't in the back seat on the F-111. I just absolutely love flying that airplane. And I was fortunate enough to get selected in 1978. The only reason, by the way, that I was able to compete to be an astronaut uh, is that they had this new crew position called Mission Specialist Astronaut on the shuttle that you did not require to be a pilot. Up to that point, all the earlier uh, programs, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, uh, you were required to be a pilot. Most people were pilots and test pilots, military test pilots. They did hire a couple civilians in the, uh, in the, along the way and sent them to pilot training, but backseaters did not get selected as astronauts back in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo program. So that was... Uh, that was how I ended up in being an astronaut because of the mission specialist position on the space shuttle, which did not require being a pilot. And those were the people that did the robot arm operations, checked out satellites, did spacewalks. I never did a spacewalk, unfortunately. We didn't do a lot of them in the early shuttle program uh, when I was in it. And let me give you my very early story. Uh, I, was a, I was in love with airplanes as far back as I can remember, almost certainly due to the influence of my father. He was a World War II aviator flying as a flight engineer and top gunner in B-17s in the Pacific uh, theater of, uh, of the war. And uh, he, like I said, he had a huge uh, influence in me. If, and I built, I wish I had some pictures of my bedroom. I had a zillion airplanes hanging on threads from uh, Revell models, plastic models hanging, hanging from threads and thumbtacks uh, from the roof of my, or from the ceiling of my bedroom. I built a lot of models. I loved it. Uh, and then I went into uh, rubber, band, rubber band powered gliders that you made out of balsa wood kits. Had a wonderful time as a kid building those. Uh, was in love with airplanes. Uh, when Sputnik was launched in 1978, excuse me, when Sputnik was launched in 1957, I was reborn. I wanted to be one of these guys. I wanted to be a John Glenn or Alan Shepard. Uh, 
I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time. There was a vast desert right outside my door where I could indulge my interest in homemade rocketry. It wasn't so much rockets as pipe bombs with fins. It's amazing I didn't blow myself to hell and back with these things. Uh, this is, uh, here I am using my dad's <laughs> car as a wind tunnel. Uh, man, I, look at the safe use of that step ladder. <laughs> can, you can you imagine seeing something like this driving down the highway in today's world? <laughs> I mean, I guarantee the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, uh, Homeland Security, <laughs> all these people would be all over me. Here I am setting up one of my creations for launch out in the New Mexico deserts near my home at the time. That's right in the middle of the housing area now, that, um, what they call the Northeast Heights of Albuquerque, but it was, we were right on the edge of the desert when I was growing up as a kid. Here I am legging it out after lighting a fuse to one of my creations. This is called hazard mitigation teenagers. <laughs> light, light a fuse and run like hell. Here's ignition and there's detonation. Whee! Yeah. You know, people here, I flew uh, combat in Vietnam and flew three times on the shuttle and they think, wow, look at all that danger you lived in your life. <laughs> Trust me, the most dangerous period in any man's life isn't whatever we do as adult men, it's when we're teenage boys. When we're teenage boys, we don't have a brain in our skulls. And this is exhibit A right here. Here's one of my successful launches. There's my capsule returning to Earth. This was a very low budget space program. My capsule was a empty Maxwell House coffee can. My nose cone was a rolled up piece of acetate plastic that was uh, masking taped into a pointy shape. Uh, my parachute was a plastic from the clothes from the dry cleaners, uh, cover the clothes from the dry cleaners. Uh, the shroud lines were kite string with uh, scotch tape to the uh, plastic. So it worked yeah. <laughs> every once in a while. Uh, here I am recovering one of my rockets from the desert. This video loops here. I want you to notice the young woman about 18, 19 years old walking off the screen to the right, right there. That is now my wife of 53 years. There's a woman who will never be able to say, I didn't know what I was getting into. Not when I had that video right there. I uh, would this... like to wager a real quick <laughs> guess that the thought going through her mind at the time was, he'll outgrow this phase. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, but no man ever grows out, out of their toys, I guess. Uh, this is my science fair project from uh, 1960. I was a sophomore year in, in high school on how rockets might one day parachute back to Earth uh, from space. I, I, this is a remarkable <clears throat> story here, I think. I had to write a report for this project, obviously, if you're... Okay participate in the space in the uh, science fair you had to have a report so this is the forward to my report and i want to share with you the first two sentences the first sentence reads today and i was writing this in 1960 three years after sputnik this country and many others throughout the world are steadily working toward the conquest of space then i continued and said someday i also plan to participate in this great undertaking i was 14 years old when i wrote that sentence that is incredible. That is amazing to, uh, you know, at age 25 years later, at age 39, uh, to now be floating around uh, in the cockpit of, of a space shuttle as an astronaut. And certainly by any human's definition, it's a dream come true. I do want to disabuse you of a thought that I suspect a lot of you have right now is that it was very easy me, for me to become an astronaut because I was born exceptional. I was gifted. I was a genius child. I had these incredible talents. Piece of cake for me to become an astronaut. A lot of people believe that, and that is not true. I was very ordinary. In fact, my wife says it's a stretch that I call myself ordinary. Uh, this is my uh, senior high school yearbook entry, and down in Ambition, I wanted to attend the Air Force Academy. Could not get into the Air Force Academy because my SAT scores were not high enough. West Point took me, which you, you saw earlier, but in all fairness to West Point, I was a third alternate for my congressional district. I barely made it into West Point. In a graduation of West Point, I wasn't on the stage getting awards for academic excellence. So get it out of your mind that I was some genius child uh, that facilitated becoming an astronaut. I was not. Uh, a few other things destiny struggled with and Mike Mullane, this is the varsity club from my high school, the star athletes in my high school. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not in this picture. <laughs> I, I was no star athlete. And this picture says it all about my youth. These are the dedication pages out of my senior high school yearbook. I have one dedication and it reads, you missed the Korean War, but here's hoping you make Vietnam. 
I'm not sure that's a dedication <laughs> or a curse. <laughs> yeah, well, in my, in my clique of geeky uh, kids, this, this uh, at the time played out as humor. The irony here is the guy that wrote this uh, also ended up in Vietnam uh, in these Navy gunboats, and he saw some heavy action over there. So it's kind of remarkable that he wrote this in 1963, and six years later, both of it, had, it came true. Six years later, we're both in Vietnam. Uh, so, so I didn't, I wasn't an astronaut because I was exceptional, but I, I might, well, I guess I was exceptional in one regard is that, uh, it turned out I was just wildly curious about, about space and aviation. Uh, and when you're a small child and I realize what a rarity of this is now, none of my children had it, none of my grandchildren have it. And very few, probably one in a million kids have it really, where you are just absolutely, totally as a child, totally focused from the dimmest memories uh, that you can have on one or two things. I mean, for me, it was aviation, aviation. And then I was exactly the same way. Was space. Yeah. And I, I, think I it played was, in wreck crop dusters. Oh, did you? You, yeah. you flew crop dusters? No, no I, I played uh, the, the airport by our house was a partly dusting strip. They had okay. a bunch of, uh, of totaled out crop dusters. And my younger brother and I, those were our Messerschmitts and Spitfires. We'd jump <laughs> in the cockpits and out chasing, you know, Germans across the sky. <laughs> Yeah, for me, it was my, uh, my father, and he was on active duty, uh, and would, he, was, uh, he stayed in the, in the Air Force after the war and was flying uh, on, as a flight engineer on these uh, military transports of the time, mm -hmm. four-engine piston jobs, uh, the C-124 and the C-97 uh, Strato Cruiser uh, were the planes that he was flying in, but uh, he, was, he would take us to the flight line on numerous occasions to climb around these airplanes that were undergoing maintenance out there. And we get to sit in the cockpits and, you know, sit there and pretend that we're flying, flying, grabbing the yoke and making all sorts of engine noise. And I swear that the crew chief probably went in there and had to clean the windshields from all the <laughs> spit from us, me and my brothers in there playing, uh, making uh, piston engine sounds like we're, we're flying. Uh, so that, that was my, uh, I'm, no doubt about it, my infatuation with aviation uh, and my dad, of course, got me into modeling, uh, helped me out when I was a very small child. And then I obviously got better at it and started doing it myself. But God, it was just so much fun. I, I look back on my youth and I really did have a wonderful time with uh, models, with uh, rubber band gliders, balsa wood gliders, uh, then graduated into a remote control. Uh, uh, used a big surgical tube to launch these gliders, uh, remote control gliders, got my son into it. Uh, Great, great, great fun. Um, oh, going on on this, uh, besides being focused on one thing, it turned out I was a passionate goal setter. I just uh, was really good about, about challenging myself to the next level. And it turned out I had an abundance of tenacity. And it was, uh, you put all that together and it made it possible for me to take my limited resources, my pretty ordinary resources as a child, and focus them and being tenacious. And that allowed me to take these steps that made it, uh, you know, the graduate school, flying in the backseat, the graduate school, the test pilot school, those type of things that ultimately, are very difficult courses, but it was this goal, focus, and tenacity that drove me through and uh, allowed me to, to be able to end up in a position where I had the credentials to compete to be an astronaut. It didn't guarantee I was gonna be an astronaut, but it, it provided me uh, the opportunity to compete. By the way, I learned a lot about goal setting and tenacity, again, through my dad. Uh, on active duty, we're in 1955, we we're in Hawaii, Hickam Air Base in Hawaii at the time, he was crippled for life with polio. They didn't have, that was about a year or two before the vaccine came out. Uh, he never again walked at age 33, never again walked and was medically discharged from the, uh, from the Air Force. And that's what brought me to New Mexico, by the way. There were no family roots, but they needed a place where a guy in a wheelchair could have some decent weather to deal with. And there were some white collar employment opportunities in the aerospace industry and a uh, place uh, to raise six kids. But the fact that with my dad in the wheelchair and my mom, uh, they faced enormous obstacles uh, due to polio in raising this family. And it was their example of just staying focused on, on their mission of raising the family, working around the obstacles polio put in front of them, being doggedly tenacious. I was only 10 years old and all this was going down, but I can see now I was imprinted with them with those examples of goal focus and tenacity. And, and that made a huge difference in my life. Uh, I'll just briefly mention, uh, I know um, 
that uh, Max has mentioned my books, but I did want to, uh, to mention here myself uh, a couple books you'll find on my website, anywhere on Amazon you can find these, by the way. Uh, but you, you can order autographed copies from, from myself on my website. But again, you get it cheaper if you want to go to uh, Amazon. But the one on the left there, Riding Rockets, I just a cautionary comment there. This is not a children's book. It is my life story, and I've had an R-rated life. And uh, I think we all have R-rated lives, and I'm very honest to who I was there. So there's a lot of adult situations and adult humor and adult language in Riding Rockets. So it's not a, a child. You, you should read it before you decide what age it's appropriate for your child. It certainly, I don't think it's appropriate for very young kids. But again, I leave it to the parents to make those decisions. Do Your Ears Pop in Space is a space fact book I wrote back after I retired from the shuttle program. Uh, it's been very popular. It answers 500 questions I've been asked as an astronaut in a simple, easy to understand way. Uh, that is appropriate for any age. Uh, adults and uh, kids would get a kick out of that. Liftoff, An Astronaut's Dream was a children's book that I wrote again shortly after I retired from NASA. Uh, that's uh, available on Amazon too. And then over to the right is my son's book, uh, The Father of the Son and the Holy Shuttle, His Coming Age Story. Uh, it, it also is adult rated. He's, he's a clone of me, a very funny guy and a very great author. It's a great book, coming age story as being an astronaut's kid. So I just wanted to mention that the one on the left, Riding Rockets and Pat, my son Pat's book are both uh, uh, adult content type of books. The other two are certainly available or certainly good for any, any age. So at that point, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to start picking up questions from Max. So let me uh, bear with me here for a second. While I, uh, this is why airplanes have checklists. <laughs> and no, folks, no I, I <laughs> forgot to hit the record button. So we're going to be doing some of this over again. My apologies to Mike. Uh, okay. First question from Eric was, uh, you flew on 41D where they had the fire. What were you thinking when you were up in the nose cone? <laughs> And that was, uh, I think we covered that in, in my narration of the uh, missions I flew. But fear was a big factor when you're sitting on top of 4 million pounds of propellant and don't have a clue, really. You don't have any visibility what's going on underneath you. But you have great confidence in the NASA team. You know those people have your back. So when they told us to sit it out in the cockpit rather than try to make that emergency escape, um, we knew that was the right thing to do. So we waited it out there. Uh, and uh, had we run out as we wanted to do, it's possible we could have run into an invisible hydrogen fire burning up the side of that vehicle. Uh, hydrogen burns clean, and uh, so that, that could, have, could have happened too. So it was a good thing that we stayed in that cockpit. Uh, Stephen K. asked what squadron you were with when you were flying the R-4C in Vietnam, because he was at Udorn. Yeah, I was in Tonsonut flying with uh, that Saigon, flying in the 16th Tactical <laughs> Reconnaissance Squadron. Um, doing missions out of out of uh, out of Saigon. Uh, John Kitt, who's uh, well, we have, this channel has a lot of Canadian followers, and John's up in Canada, and he was asking if you knew the astronaut Chris Hadfield. Uh, no, I did not meet him. I left in 1990, and he came in well after that. He was a uh, talented, talented dude, man. I, I watched his uh, videos. He was sending down from the uh, ISS, and man, I'll tell you, very talented man. Uh, you know, uh, since you're talking about talent, uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, Judy Resnick. I, uh, I know in the book, you guys are real close friends. Um, and I, after reading about you and I went and looked at her bio, you know, the old opposites attract. You're talking about how you were a third alternate at getting to West Point and in your book, you detail your adventures at West Point. Uh, on the other hand, she maxed out the SAT, was like super genius um, and I, uh, just thought, uh, was it a little intimidating to work with somebody that was so brilliant? <laughs> yeah. Not just her, all those women were very, you know, uh, the, the top of their class and whatever they were doing. I was, uh, definitely intimidated, uh, by the, I mean, they were very, very smart, much smarter than me. Uh, as a, as a guy, if you read my book, I talk about what the precept, uh, preconceptions that we had as military people who had never worked with women professionally in the aviation world or any world for that matter. And now we're thrown in with these pioneering women, the first women to fly in, uh, first women to fly in space. We're all from my, uh, my class of astronauts. 
And we had, uh, I think as military people, we were questioning it, you know, what are they doing here? What are they bringing to the table? And uh, because we worked in an all male environment our whole, whole lives. So uh, we had to, and I talk about that in my book, by the way, it, uh, it, you know, I, I Very learned. Very candidly, I might add. Yeah, I was right, I, I do. It's a, jo- a journey and I talk about that. I was, I was raised to see women in traditional roles. Uh, I was raised 12 years of Catholic school uh, a mother that stayed at home, did the traditional role thing, and then was never in any environment that had professional women, uh, went to West Point, all male, and then the military flying, all male. So the first time I was working professionally with women was at age 32 when I was selected as an astronaut. And, and uh, like I said, it took a while to, to set these preconceptions mm-hmm. aside. These women brought a lot to the table, brought as much as any man did. I'll tell you that right now. They were very talented. Judy was, Sally Ride was, uh, they all were. So, uh, uh, and that, I, I have gone, uh, when you read my book, make sure you read it to the end to see my mm-hmm. conversion from male mm-hmm. sexist pig to enlightenment. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, even right now, I am fiercely an advocate for, hey, I want everybody bringing their talents to the table in everything. I don't care what their gender is. I don't care what their background is, color, any of that religion. I want everybody. That's what makes a Western democracy great is that everybody has the opportunity to bring their talents to the table to solve uh, political problems, technical problems, uh, entrepreneur problems, uh, all of these things. I want everybody bringing their talents to the table. The uh, um, Maurice asked, did you fly with any astronauts from other countries? Were there any troubles with integration? I did not fly with uh, any from uh, other countries, uh, so I can't talk to that. Uh, I know uh, that we do have done since since uh, the end of Apollo, we work closely with the Russians. Uh, so you'd have to talk to some of those <laughs> folks about about working working with them. But then, of course, there's been a lot of other other uh, countries that have flown on the shuttle. Uh, their astronauts have flown, but I never flew with any of them. Uh, from SC Super Heavy, who I believe I believe he's a uh, uh, freighter pilot out of South Carolina, flying. Uh, I think he's flying the Dreamlifters. Um, he says, what was more fun, flying a Phantom or flying the shuttle, and which was more frightening, the shuttle or the Phantom <laughs> in combat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, again, I wasn't a pilot. I certainly had uh, a lot of stick time in the backseat of the F-4. Uh, there's a full set of controls in the F-4, and uh, so the pilots, you know, I, I had, I bet I had a thousand hours of time. I had to be a great instrument pilot, by the way, flying backseat of that pilot, a uh, backseat of the, of the uh, RF-4. Uh, but the, uh, if you talk about combat, the anticipatory fear in, in combat, when you see a tracer whiz by, you know, obviously it's, it's scary. I mean, it's your heart is in your throat and you get that pounding adrenaline, uh, but it's gone in seconds. If that, I mean, they missed your, your home free, you're clear. Uh, so I, in Vietnam, I did not have the anticipatory fear I would later experience for a shuttle launch. Shuttle, and I'm very, uh, I talk about this in, in my book, um, when you're astronauts, you never admit to fear. I, never, <laughs> I don't think I ever told a, a reporter that I was you know, scared sitting out on that launch bed. I do in my book, though, because I was scared. I suspect most astronauts are. The reason being, there's no escape system. You know, when you strap into that, it has, on the shuttle, pre-Challenger, no escape system. I flew once before Challenger and twice after. Uh, but the shuttle was thought to be as safe and as reliable as a high-flying 747. Uh, so it was not designed to have any type of escape system, pods, ejection seats, any of that. And obviously that proved uh, faulty in the reasoning there. But uh, so you're out there on that pad and you're in this high performance vehicle and you have no way of escaping once it lifts off. That is a frankly, a terrifying type of thought. Uh, you've seen, you know, coming from a military background, you've seen airplanes fail in the past and people needing that escape system to, to be saved. And, and in fact, I actually uh, had an escape system used. I was on the F, on my first flight in an F-111, uh, swing wing fighter bomber out of Eglin. I'm, it was a crew error all the way here on this, but basically I ended up ejecting, or we ended up ejecting from this F-111. So my life was saved by an escape system. In this case, the F-111 has a capsule escape system. You didn't uh, mention that in the book, did you? I don't yeah, well, no, I did. I don't go I into it. Because I, I, I would have remembered that. 
I mentioned that I used uh, an aircraft escape system, but the circumstances of that was it was my first flight in the F-111 out of Eglin Air Force Base, um, flying with a high time pilot, doing some supersonic weapons testing over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in the course of that weapons test, we reached bingo fuel. We had one data point to continue to get the pilot elected to press past that bingo fuel. For those of you unfamiliar with it, means that's your go home fuel state. And, um, and he uh, decided to press ahead and finish this last data point. And that ended up putting us uh, in a very critically low fuel state, uh, which distracted the pilot on the way back, certainly distracted me. And so we ended up uh, uh, due to, I won't go into all the complications here, but basically we had one landing attempt and the distractions uh, that occurred uh, uh, with the pilot coming into that, um, uh, he, he basically botched the, the only landing tip attempt we're going to get. It gets complicated here, folks. The F-111 is critical. You set the wing sweep to the correct wing sweep for the fuel state, or otherwise your center of gravity is out of limits. And if that's out of limits, you're out of control. We set the wings to the right fuel state, but on F-111s that touched down, the pilots had a habit of sweeping the wings full forward to induce drag, take some load off the brakes. We touched down too hot, too fast, bounced back into the air, but the pilot in that re instinctive reflex swept the wings full forward. That put our CG out of limits. I didn't see any, I mean, I, I had no wear. Uh, I did not know he had swept the wings full forward. Uh, but anyway, it put our CG out of limits. We ended up in a wild porpoising maneuver and uh, I initiated, initiated ejection when it looked to me like, uh, well, our nose was down, the runway's <laughs> filling, uh, filling my face and, uh, and initiated ejection at that point. Got one swing on the chute in that capsule before you hit the ground. But uh, that's what I mean. You, you, in the military, it's, it's very complex machines. Sometimes the crews fail, sometimes the machines fail, but you depend on that escape system and uh, you don't have that on the shuttle. So the anticipatory fear of flying a shuttle mission was much, much greater than anything I ever experienced flying into, into combat. Now, when you got shot at, Yes, the fear is certainly extreme, but it, again, it didn't last long. Uh, whereas in the shuttle, you have a lot of time to be thinking about what's getting ready to happen. So, yeah, you're well, up there a couple of hours before the launch, even if you don't have any delays, right? It's not even that. Go back, <laughs> even what you reach, what I call what we call prime crew. You're in line to fly in space. Mm -hmm. There's these missions in front of you. Finally, the last mission in front of you lands, and now you're next. And I talk about this in the book is that um, when you're training and you have all of these flights in front of you and you have all the worries that something is going to happen on one of these flights, it's going to snatch the flight, your flight from you uh, for whatever reason, you know, malfunction that delays the program, they have to reshuffle the flight manifest with payloads and you're attached to a payload and it moves further back in line or whatever. You just, you're paranoid. You went so desperately to fly. And so that's in the back of your mind, it's almost theoretical that you're really going to fly until that last mission in front of you landed and, and you realize, Oh my God, I'm next. And I remember uh, bolting awake in the middle of the night with my heart just pounding, 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 scared the, been, you know, stick inside of my wife, <laughs> but I would bolt awake with this overwhelming, powerful sense that I'm, this is going to happen. I am going to get on top of that rocket and I am going to fly into space. And all of the joy and fear and this tumble of motions just crept out of my brain uh, when the defenses were down when I was asleep and, uh, and just would wake me up from a dead sleep. Uh, so the, again, that anticipatory fear and joy, I mean, you're, you're joyful about it, but it, it's something that just, you know, it's hard to describe, but uh, I was scared out of that, on that launch pad. Short answer. Okay. Every one of my missions, people ask if it got better. No, <laughs> I was terrified on the first mission, second mission, third mission. Launches. Uh, that's what uh, is really in our minds, the most dangerous, obviously the, you, in any aviation space, mm -hmm. you can die at any point at any time. Uh, but you have this sense that there's an immense amount of things that can go wrong in that hellish ride into space. 
When I say hellish, I'm talking about what's going on with the machinery. You got 4 million pounds of propellant being consumed in eight and a half minutes. And you have these turbo pumps spinning at these incredible RPMs and these incredible temperatures and, uh, and then APU uh, hydraulic units, same thing, you know, just shed a blade and that's it, man. Gonna blow the rear end of that vehicle off and you have no way of escaping. So that's on your mind. Well, you mentioned sleeping. I was curious, this is a question for me, is that uh, in space, I understand the demands on the body are less, so you tend not to sleep as much. My question was, do you get good quality sleep in, in, in microgravity? I never did because my missions were too short to really fall into a reliable uh, sleep pattern. Uh, my, my missions uh, were five, the longest mission was six days, I believe, a little less than that maybe. Uh, but um, uh, the, when I was up there, uh, I had the attitude like, I can sleep when I get back to earth. If I have, <laughs> if I have any time available, I'm gonna be at that window looking out the window. Yep. So what I did is typically put my sleeping bag, uh, it's not a bag in the sense that you're laying it, you're floating, it's called a sleep restraint. Because you can go to sleep, just close your eyes and go to sleep and weightlessness, um, every position's the same. Problem with that is you'll float around and perhaps end up <laughs> in an, an embarrassing embrace with a fellow crew member. <laughs> so uh, we, we restrain ourselves from floating around by being in these sleeping bags, they look like. But I pinned mine underneath the uh, overhead windows and because the shuttle at the time was uh, preferred attitude, if there was no other reason, was, was uh, top to earth for thermal reasons, the heating and expansion and mm -hmm. cooling on the structure, it was best to have the shuttle with the top to the, uh, down to the earth. So that put these nice windows that we had in the top of the vehicle as looking down on the earth. So I just slipped into my sleeping bag and would just look out the window at these uh, sites passing underneath. Eventually though, you would, you know, fatigue would get you and you'd fall asleep and then wake up when the sun rose again 45 minutes later and look out the window again and fall asleep. So I never got any decent sleep up there, but I didn't care. I just, all I wanted to do was look out the window. Now I'm sure on a space station for months and months, you're going to fall into some reliable sleep, sleep patterns. Uh, Paul B asked, uh, what it was, what was it like <laughs> to be in a multi-level space flight deck in zero gravity, as opposed to a capsule? Did the Skylab missions help prepare NASA for the shuttle in any way? I, that, that goes well, uh, Skylab, well before my time. I never flew in any capsules. I only flew in the space shuttle, so I can't directly compare that. The, uh, the, the multi-level deck like that, it was wonderful in weightlessness because the cockpit seems incredibly cramped uh, when, you're, when you're in it out on the pad or doing any type of simulations. But it's amazing when all of a sudden the, any area, any volume becomes usable, and that's what occurs in weightlessness, how roomy it seems. Uh, I was, that's one thing that really surprised me, even in the upper cockpit, which is very cramped. I was, I was just amazed that all of a sudden it seemed very, very roomy, uh, to, because mm -hmm. of every volume is, is available. By the way, the, the, one of the problems with, the, with, uh, with being up there is that, uh, keeping track of things. Uh, everything, we had Velcro pads all over the inside of the cockpit and all of our tools, cameras, checklists, everything had the, the hook Velcro and you'd you know, stick it to one of those pads. But the problem was, is on earth, if you're, if you're looking for something that you might have misplaced, you don't look on the ceiling or walls and you're looking around on a desk or floor or something, right? Well, up there, you, you find yourself, you'll, you'll be floating and there's a pad and you're doing something, you stick with a tool uh, right there. And you're, but meanwhile, you're floating and maybe you have another piece, you stick it on a pad here. And next time you finish and you need these pieces or checklists or tools or whatever it is, and you start going, you know, <laughs> you know and that, so you takes so a, you, you have to learn to be very uh, early on to be very, uh, uh, sharp with where you uh, keep your memory sharp on where you stick things as you're working on things or else you're going to be hunting all over for it. Well, uh, just based on books I've read that uh, in Mercury and Gemini, they didn't really have any problem with uh, the SAS, the space uh, was an adaptation syndrome. Right. Yeah. They started in Apollo because they could actually get out of their seats because of course Mercury and Gemini were pretty much strapped to your seat the whole time. But she said they, to this day, they still haven't, uh, and, and folks, uh, space adaptation syndrome, if I remember, is basically what people, layman's term space sickness uh, or motion sickness, but, but they say it's, that's actually not it, but it's why the, a lot of the astronauts get sick. You didn't have any problem with that yourself though, right? No, I did not, which is, uh, this is what uh, really 
makes this a tough nut to crack for the flight surgeons is there is it is not correlated to earth motion sickness. I have barfed in the back of those F4s countless times. I mean, countless times. Uh, I get seasick. You said sick. it actually became problematic in your training, didn't right. you? Right. I, I almost got eliminated from uh, flight training for that reason. In fact, if I didn't have a pilot, Ev Vaughn, my pilot in Vietnam, go to bat for me when we were in training for, for Vietnam, uh, I, the squadron commander was ready to cut me. And wow. he, he said he had, uh, he'd take care of me. So at any rate, uh, I, I, uh, it was, I mean, he filled bag after bag uh, in the back of those phantoms. Uh, got better as time went on, but uh, seasick, oh my, I do not, I've never been on a cruise. I am never going on a cruise. <laughs> uh, I uh, get, hate roller coasters, uh, get sick on those. So I have a very high sensitivity to, to motion sickness on earth. Mm. Going up in space, had absolutely no symptoms, none whatsoever. I had barf bags in every pocket ready for a quick draw. I was certain I was going to get sick on that shuttle. Never did. Never, not, not a ripple on any of my missions. And then we have test pilots who have never been motion sick on earth, fly in space and vomit for a couple of days. So that's what makes it so, so difficult for the uh, docs to, to figure out what the mechanism that causes it. Now, I don't know what they're doing now about it, but they finally, you know, early on, they try these holistic type of things, trying to uh, prevent this. And eventually they gave up and just went to nuclear uh, <laughs> injected anti-nausea. Uh, you talk net. about the Marine and the hypodermic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'd have to, I'd have, we had a Marine get on one of my flights. Basically everybody, we didn't, I didn't have any medical doctors on any of my flights. Now NASA now has a lot of medical doctors, probably on any particular flight uh, you're going to have a doctor there. But so we had air crew or, or uh, crew members that would have, one crew member would have to train to be the doc. And so they took him to the flight surgeon and allowed him to stick a couple hypodermics in an orange. That was his, his uh, experience. And on our, one of our missions, uh, the Marine, who was the doc needed to inject uh, uh, somebody who was vomiting. And I thought to myself, I'd have to feel real bad before I let a Marine come at me with a needle. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a problem ever since they had cockpits big enough to float around in. I don't know that I've, uh, I don't know, maybe even in the Mercury program strapped in, some guys might have gotten sick. I, they I never would have admitted it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That is one of the problems is that even in my era, uh, there was a disconnect between the flight surgeon's data and what crews were aware of ourselves. And the reason was is nobody wanted to say they got sick for fear it was going to have an impact on future missions, particularly on spacewalk missions. Like if you vomit in a spacesuit, your life could be in danger because mm -hmm. you could aspirate the fluid. It's not going to fall on the ground or into a toilet. It's going to be floating right in front of your face. So it could be very dangerous. Uh, so people were tended to to be very closed mouth about. Oh what, yeah. And what it's still that way in, in exactly. aviation era. The pilots and aeromedical, man, they, I get my two medicals a year and the rest of the time you, you zip up, you know, like. Yeah. It can't, yeah. when you go into a, if, if you got wings on your chest and like to fly, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you can't win going into a flight surgeon's exam. You can no only. No good comes out of that. Right. Right, you can't win. It doesn't make you a better pilot. You don't get uh, an attaboy or anything. <laughs> but boy, if that blood pressure all of a sudden shows high, yep. leave your wings on the table and that type I, of thing. I made a joke years ago. If you want to terrify a pilot at uh, Halloween, don't dress as a monster. Just put on a white lab coat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With a stethoscope. Yeah, <laughs> you'll stay away from them. <laughs> uh, Charles asked, and and this gets into like orbital dynamics, but uh, he said. Uh, could they burn more fuel on reentry to slow the speed and provide less air break instead of hitting the atmosphere at Mach 25? No, and the reason for that is conservation of energy. You would need eight, well, close to 17,500 miles per hour to get into orbit, and that takes a lot of fuel. In the case of the shuttle, it takes four million pounds of it. If you want to basically fly the orbiter back, or uh, let's say like uh, SpaceX land vertically. Or let's, let's say you want to get the shuttle back just like SpaceX. You want to slow down and you want to land, uh, well, you wouldn't land the shuttle vertically, but it would take, to do that, it would take 4 million pounds of propellant. Okay. You, there's no free ride. So if it takes the 4 million equation. pounds, it, it's going to take not 4 million pounds to slow it down, basically to land you know, without any aerodynamic uh, heating. Uh, and that is why 
because you don't have fuel to get to get back, uh, you use the atmosphere as a brake. Uh, that's the, that's what clips off our our speed is that atmosphere, and that makes for that super hot reentry that uh, aerodynamic heating. This next one, I think we actually kind of already covered. It was from Claire. Uh, apparently, her personal doctor had been a flight surgeon for two shuttle missions. Um, and she was asking if somebody gets injured or really sick in flight, would the mission's flight surgeon on the ground, you know, make a so-called house call? Uh, and I guess what she's getting at is uh, if somebody got injured or sick, and assuming you didn't want to terminate the mission, you say you had, now they have doctors up there, but before they did, you're just going to like do another procedure based on what the, the, the how would you guys handle that? Well, the flight surgeon on the ground would certainly be sending up infra, uh, directions for anybody that was experiencing some type of medical medical issue. Uh, if it was very serious, uh, as in life-threatening serious, they would bring us home at the earliest safe opportunity they could do it. They're not just going to have us land in, in uh, Timbuktu to get somebody to a hospital uh, with all the dangers associated with that. The next U.S. landing site opportunity that could be safely done would be done to get somebody back in a life, life-threatening situation. Now, they, people ask, uh, I mean, what, what could you do in space? Suppose somebody has a heart attack in space. Well, actually they provided, when you think about it, if you pound on somebody's chest, let's say for whatever reason, cardiac arrest, you're trying to give somebody CPR. If you pound on their chest, what's going to happen in weightlessness? Newton's law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite action. You're, you're not going to pound on their chest. You're going to be pushed back. So they had the, the process for doing this would be to dress somebody, they had a harness for this, that you would dress this person in that needed the help and pin them to the locker wall. And then you would straddle them and, ha and have a harness that would pin you there and allow you to do CPR. Well, good luck. You know, after that process prepared, if somebody's in that type of a situation with cardiac arrest, by the time you did all of that, you know, there's no hope to, for anybody. So, uh, Zero gravity makes it a, a lot more difficult for some of the things that you first aid that would be employed here on Earth. But nowadays, you know, that's, these are type of things that are going to have to be, uh, well, they're always addressed very, very thoroughly uh, through physical exams to make sure people are not likely to have a problem. Uh, but of course, you know, you can only see so much uh, as a doc. The, um, but you talk about going to, you know, <laughs> going to bars. And having a problem there, uh, I, I, you know, how do you how do you prepare for that? You know, it's going to be tough. I tell you one thing: I envision that anybody going to Mars isn't going to be carrying their wisdom teeth. I bet <laughs> they. I bet prophylactically they do things. I, I don't I'm know. I should, they got their appendix and their exact. That, that's what, yeah. That, well, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, I, I don't know. I would not be surprised though that the docs, I would think wisdom teeth, you know, for sure, anything's yeah. give you a toothache, you're going to probably take care of down here on earth, but would they take out somebody's appendix? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I know that Jim Irwin, I, I talked to Al Warden about this down at the Cape when he was, uh, uh, I met him down there and I'd read that Jim Irwin did have a heart attack when the lunar module left the surface of the moon and, uh, it was a mild one, but, uh, the, when they got him back in the command module, they, uh, it took the docs a little while to figure out exactly what had happened and it had passed, but they, uh, they said that, uh, look, he's in a pure oxygen environment and zero G there's really, you know, they gave him some pills and it's about, he's in as good a condition as he'd be in. So yeah. they kept that rule quiet for obvious reasons for a long time. But once the guys retired and started writing their books, it came out. I so, think he uh, died of a heart attack, didn't he? He did, on? He did oh, at yeah. a fairly young age too. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think he was yeah. only in his fifties. There's only so much you're going to learn uh, on those treadmills and those EKGs. And 1960s medicine also. They yeah. didn't exactly have MRIs. Uh, I tell you, I, I probably won't live to see a Mars trip, but man, I, I don't know how they're going to address that. But I, I, Every science channel I've watched about the reality of going to Mars is borders on nightmarish. The things they would have to do, the decisions that would have to be made. Yeah. Uh, they're going to have to take more than one ship because if you break down part way, <laughs> you can't fix yeah. it. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I just, it's going to be a huge logistic uh, problem to, to, to be able to do that. I, well, the big, I, I think the big mistake the lay person makes is they equate going to the Mars to going to the moon. And it's like, I think the number was 80 times logistically as complex as a lunar mission. Well, the time to get to the moon is two and a half days to get to Mars is under the best alignment of the planets is seven months or close to seven months. 
And then you got to wait for 22 months, I think it is, before mm -hmm. the planets line up again for that short seven, mile, seven month trip back. So basically a Mars trip is going to be the better part of three years, unless we come up with better technology than for propulsion. I'm talking about current chemical propulsion. That's what you're looking at. Now, maybe somebody will find those dilithium crystals and <laughs> we'll be able to zip up there in a half hour. But until that happens, it's going to be a tough, tough uh, nut to crack there. This one I'm sure you get a lot, probably more than anything else. It's from Alfred, and it's uh, at any time in orbit did the crew see anything they couldn't identify? I, I get, yeah, UFOs, aliens, yeah. I get that question a lot. Uh, I never saw, no, no, my answer is no. I never saw anything. I never heard a shuttle astronaut say they saw anything uh, that they, they couldn't identify. Um, my personal beliefs about aliens is, given the enormity of the universe, I believe there's life elsewhere in the universe. And I believe there's intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. That said, though, I do not believe it has ever visited Earth. Because I think if it ever did, it would land and make a significant unambiguous contact. It just doesn't make sense to me that an alien civilization would come to Earth and then hide from us. That, uh, maybe uh, people explain that away, but uh, I still find that hard to believe. It'd be like us sending a mission, a, a trillion dollar mission to Mars, and seeing evidence of civilization or life on Mars and then land on the other side of the planet, you know, just, or, or make some, you know, just weird, uh, you know, hide from it. I, I just, that just doesn't make sense to me, but then, you know, who knows? Why would they the only try to contact rednecks and, you know, fields out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I do. I, do, I have uh, the same similar attitude. I'm yeah. sure there's life out there, but I doubt they've been here. Yeah, I just, you're right about that. I, I joke about that. How come they only appear <laughs> to beer drinking fishermen and lonely widow rancher ladies in New Mexico? You know, but then just, again, <laughs> maybe it's the same reason we go out in the woods with a rifle and look for the lone deer. <laughs> hey, yeah. watch Herb, this is fun. <laughs> we'll pick yeah. him up with the anti-gravity ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah, but, it, but I tell people, by the way, you can believe anything you want on that topic. You know, uh, <laughs> you know there's an expression, you never talk about religion, politics, uh, you know, religion or politics, mm -hmm. I would add UFOs. Yeah. People are fiercely possessive of their opinion about UFOs. So I've, I don't argue anybody on that. If they said they've seen them or been kidnapped by them, I said, fine. I just, I'm not going to argue. I wasn't there. Uh, yeah. uh, Rick asked, uh, since writing the book, uh, uh, how has it, uh, wait, 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 since writing the book, how has it been being a former astronaut and uh, what are your views on the current space efforts? So kind of like what's life post astronaut and what oh, you what's yeah, on? where am I? Yeah, I, uh, well, I, uh, you know, I've been gone for since 1990. Uh, I mean, as a retired astronaut, I, I have a, a business of uh, speaking on teamwork, leadership and safety. Uh, I By the way, to, I like your, I have, I have your yeah. normalization of deviance, I think is uh, particularly important uh, where I work. Phenomena, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. That, by the way, folks, is what caused the Challenger tragedies where people take little risks and get away with it, become comfortable and start taking more and more and more and normalize that risk taking into their behavior, which was uh, one of the primary causes of Challenger's loss. They had early indication or problems with that O-ring design, uh, but for various reasons it was accepted. And then when they saw it again, it became easier to accept it again. And, and so that acceptance that deviance was normalized into behavior. By the way, that term is something I first read in Diane Vaughn's book on the Challenger tragedy uh, called the Challenger launch decision. But that's why I first read, read that term normalization of deviance. But at any rate, uh, so I, do, I was doing live programs for corporations on teamwork, leadership and safety. Now I do much fewer uh, <laughs> uh, virtual programs because most people have uh, you know, closed up shops, basically, uh, you know, drawn back on since COVID started. So I'm hoping after COVID's over, I, maybe I can get back on the road and do some of these live events as, as I was doing before. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, as an astronaut, uh, you're a minor celebrity, a very minor. Uh, I, and since I get requests for autographs and, and things like that, um, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's, I take out my own garbage, folks, if that's what you're, <laughs> if, if you're wondering about it. So life isn't all that different from what it was uh, before being an astronaut. Um, what do you think about what's going on with the program now, now it's getting largely commercial oh, through? Yeah, I initially, uh, when I heard about what was uh, being planned, 
uh, with this privatization of Earth orbit. Like every astronaut, I was retired at the time. This happened in 2010 when that decision was made. But uh, I thought it was insanity. I thought, God, this is disaster. How is that going to ever work? You know, I was very negative about it. And this is, by the way, is a classic example of not being a, these, these visionaries out there that think outside of the box. You know, they, it's, as an astronaut, that's the way we've always done it. How could there be any mm -hmm. other model than we've de done it before? In-house, the government does this. They have the resources. How could it ever be done different? So when they privatized it, I was very negative on that. Well, boy, you talk about flipping 180 degrees on that attitude. I'm all for it. Uh, the excitement that Musk has brought to the, to the space uh, geeks out there is incredible. I mean, it's just amazing what that guy's doing and how fast he's doing it. Even NASA will admit that where he get, has gone, gotten has uh, been years ahead of what they could have ever done and billion dollars cheaper to the taxpayer. So uh, billions of dollars cheaper to the taxpayers. So uh, I'm really excited about this uh, privatization of low Earth orbit and the opportunities it's given to inject a lot of excitement into the space program. Uh, but I'm also a big on the unmanned programs too. I'm, I'm already sweating bullets about the February landing attempt of that probe mm -hmm. we have headed to Mars. We, uh, I, I just, I love our, our robot uh, program too. I uh, was wondering, did you ever do the the uh, meet an astronaut at the Cape thing? Yes, I did. I was doing that on a regular basis over the July 4th weekend. I'd bring my kids and, and grandkids down there uh, since that was when they could get off of uh, work around the 4th of July weekend. So usually a 4th of July period, holiday. Uh, so 4th of July, I was down there for you know, five, seven days uh, doing that lunch with an astronaut and that astronaut encounter down there. Of course, that's all off the table with COVID. It's, it's a tragedy. I think I, I, I used to have a commander's club card because, you know, I live here in Florida. I was doing reserve in Orlando. So I was living down at the Cape, did the tours while I was waiting to get, you know, on reserve, see if they needed me. And uh, uh, I dragged my nephews down there and they got to meet John Blaha and uh, Al Worden and I was in yeah. Sam Gamar. And I was like, you know, these are real astronauts. They have been in space. Yeah. I also met Bruce McCandless as a teenager before he had done his uh, shuttle flight. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I know him well. Fifth, I live in Florida. You're only a fifth astronaut I've chatted with. So, well, I was in the movie From the Earth to the Moon and as an extra, and Dave Scott stood right beside me. And I knew who he was, but they were adamant. You're an extra. You're not a principal. You don't talk to the talent. You don't talk to the technical advisors. And we're all sitting in the mission, the moker panels, and he reached out to tell a guy something. He's leaning right over me. I'm like, wow, I'm looking in a moonwalker's armpit. I've never been so honored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that reminds me. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> Your story there reminds me of Galaxy Quest, that guy that, <laughs> that, that was, the was the, ever made. The, the, it was the expendable guy, the guy that nobody knew his name because he <laughs> died in every name. mission. That, that was you. You're gonna lucky comic relief. <laughs> yeah, you're you're gonna die on this on this on this mission because nobody. I'm not even gonna make the first commercial break. <laughs> um, I, well, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say I was. I loved that Galaxy Quest. I I thought that was just a terrific parody on uh, that movie. Star is so Trek. aware of itself. They they, yeah. they know they knew their audience. Uh, that, <laughs> that is like my wife and I's favorite movie. Um, I can, as you can probably get, I can quote about most of it. Uh, Did you guys never watch the show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Tim Allen getting his shirt off and doing those uh, rolls, rolls in the dirt. Off again. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that was, that was great, great, great flick. Oh, uh, it was. Um, uh, now here's uh, a question. I, I missed meeting Story Musgrave at the Orlando airport, the uh, NASA store by about five minutes. He was there promoting his book on the T-38. Apparently he was an avid photographer. <laughs> um, and I, I have it over here. It's this, and they charged me like an extra, I forget how many dollars because it was autographed um and she's like you just missed him but um now being an airline pilot i fly with a lot of air force guys uh, a lot of them who trained in the t-38 uh i've watched a lot of video about it uh some of the guys have told me point blank that airplane scared them really um, well they were um because this is about they were they were guys who went through when you had to go t-37 t-38 no matter what you were flying and what he, what he meant by they scared them was is that you couldn't take your eyes off of it because it could get such a sync rate you couldn't even eject out of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you had to yeah. be careful with it. 
I, I was thinking, yeah, right. Uh, I was, you were talking about pilot training going from a slow mover to a fast mover like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I could understand that when you first make that transition, you're certainly going to gonna have some white knuckles, but uh, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I have, I have 800 hours in the backseat of that. I thought it was a wonderful well, airplane. That brought the quiet. I remember you talking about the little boo-boo on the arrestor cables and I used to land, yeah. I used to fly into Eglin in a beach 1900 every day, a couple of times a day. So I know those, how big those freaking arrestor, you know, you see them on TV or something. They don't look that big. Would you walk? My God, those cables are huge. Yeah. Um, and uh and i have no trouble seeing it bending a nose uh, rim especially on the super high pressure tires but that got me quick did nasa ever qualify a non-military rated pilot as pic in the t-38s yes in the they pilot did. program yeah in fact uh, uh jack schmidt the last man oh, harrison jack yeah. yeah 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 he was a civilian they sent him to pilot training uh they did it for they did for a ha handful of those uh, those civilians they were selecting uh, scientists. Uh, but they wouldn't do it for you. They wouldn't. Let no, you there was actually uh, actually some discussion about doing that when we were hired of uh, doing that. But then NASA, you know, for money reasons, you know, mm. that takes that takes a, a year to do. Since somebody yeah. do pilot training, you know, it is very expensive. So um, NASA decided they didn't need uh, need people that were they didn't need any pilots. They had plenty of them in the form of the test pilots. Well, since you mentioned Jack Schmidt, I have to take now take this for what it's worth. I'm jump seating on a Delta L1011. I'm up in the cockpit because it's full. Uh, the flight engineer is a retired Air Force pilot who had been a UPT guy, uh, a, a FAPE, mm -hmm. uh, and a first assignment instructor pilot. And he said that he was the one that had taught Schmidt. He'd give him something. He, he said that uh, Gene Cernan said it best about Jack. If if God had not had intended man to fly, he would have named him Harrison Jack Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was it was a, it was pretty marginal. But they figure well, he's going to be up there in the lunar module. He's got to know how. But uh, take that for what it's worth. I don't mean to yeah. to, to to say anything negative about uh, about Jack Schmidt because uh, but that was just something that the guy said. He goes, oh, trust me, I instructed him. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I know. Uh, I I imagine there were some of those stories back between those guys of uh, I, we we never experienced that because the people who were hired as back as mission specialists were never expected to fly, but I think most of us got pretty good. Again, there's a full set of controls in the back of the T thirty eight, and I got to be very good on instrument flying there. <laughs> So. Um, I was just watching, uh, there's a YouTube channel, uh, out there. Uh, I think it's CW Lemoyne. He's a F 18 guy who now flies, I think it's Southwest or someplace. Well, he, he got in the local, uh, air force reserve unit out at Tyndall and they're, they're aggressors in the T 38. So they, they recalled him and he had not flown a T 38 before cause I think he'd originally been a Navy guy. Anyway, he shows his first training flight in a T-38. And this is a guy with, you know, thousands and thousands of hours and a lot of fighter jet time. And he said it was a very humbling experience, a very trick. And I, you just said that the airplane just looks so twitchy and dinky little wings out there. And I'm yeah. kind of like, that's, that's gotta be a hoop, but I can also see how from, for a guy like me, that's only flown civilian aircraft. And now I fly airliners, which are rock solid. I mean, they're hands off machines most of the time. I, I could see if somebody's like, well, you, you, you fly jets. I'm sure you fly T-38. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. That, it actually pretty intimidating little airplane. Yeah. Least, well, I, yeah. I, I think in going transitioning from any uh, uh, airplane uh, to a, to a higher performance airplane is, is certainly going to have that intimidation factor. But everyone who wants to get up to speed on it, they just rave about it. Sam Gaymar couldn't say enough good things about it. He was just like, that was yeah. his favorite part of being an astronaut. He says, yeah. that's his, my favorite part. He shows a picture of a T-30 is this on a government credit card. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he, there's something to be said for that. Uh, think about flying the shuttle. You did it so seldom and the preparations was, were so years long. It, it, I think looking back on my career, the, the best time in my life was flying as a first lieutenant in the back of a tactical fighter jet. You know, there was nothing expected of you except to go out and do the mission. And uh, that, of course, is a very narrow window after you get promoted. You have more responsibilities. You uh, sit behind a desk and, you know, that type of thing. But, boy, being a first lieutenant in a combat operation uh, in the backseat of a Mach 2 type of airplane, that was that was a thrill. Well, um, when yeah. I was uh, I was taxiing out of uh, Eglin. And I'm in a little turboprop, which of course has air conditioning. And I see four F-15s waiting to do their mission. So they're sitting over their engines going. 
And I see the guy sitting like this in the cockpits on that plexiglass bubble in Florida with their masks off. And I've been told yeah. it's got a pretty good air conditioner, but sitting under a plexiglass bubble yeah. and you were in Vietnam, which is even more. So I was wondering, was that like, what was the most miserable part of being in the backseat of the F4? And I'm assuming it was cooking alive in the cockpit, but. Uh, no, it was, uh, well, I don't think I was ever the first, when I was first getting into flying, uh, transition initially I went to navigator training that's where we all started and that was done on transport type airplane a twin engine conveyor piston airplane that was had all these stations for navigator training on it with radars and drift meters and and LORAN and all these other systems that were were out there uh, but then getting into a fighter jet the first uh, on the first couple times probably first you know many times um, that the claustrophobic feeling of being in a harness, of being this five point connection, being strapped to an ejection seat. We, had, we wore uh, garters around our, our calves to, in case of an ejection. So you're, you're literally wearing the airplane tied into it. And the very first, uh, I don't know, half, probably a dozen times, I, I, it was so constraining to have that helmet on, the mask on, and uh, you just, had this kind of semi claustrophobic feeling, but then after a while it became so incredibly comfortable. You just loved to get in there and just feel the, like you, literally putting on the airplane. I, it, it went 180 flip there with uh, that sense of, oh man, this is comfortable being in here, strapped in, he helmet on, mask on. Uh, I, I came to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, talk, you compared the F-4 to the F-111, and of course, the F-111, you could see out the windshield, which I'm sure was a game changer, but it sounded like you really preferred the F-111 as just a ride compared to the Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, it were different missions, obviously, but and I never flew it in a tactical mission. It was all, all uh, weapons, weapons testing. I did a lot of EF-111 training, too, the electronic warfare version of it. Uh, but uh, I was, we did go up to Tonopah in Nevada and drop... Uh, uh, weapons up there that they had an instrumented instrumented range that would uh, film the separation and uh, various aspects of the basically the weapon separating from the aircraft and functioning. Uh, they didn't blow up. Uh, there were there were mass simulators of various types of munitions, but we would be very low and at very high Mach. Well, uh, what, we would be going like 1.2, 1.3 Mach at 100 feet off the ground. Uh, very flat out there uh, and that is a thrill to be that low and going that fast uh, and here you are and with this nice big windshield in front of you I love that one flight I was flying back with this uh, high time F-111 pilot who had been uh, in the combat operations with it was very familiar with the terrain following radar and he engaged that terrain following radar it was that was like a third generation compared to what I had in the F-4. This the F-4 is it was not integrated into the flight control system, whereas in the F-111 F it is. So it's hands off. You engage that thing, and it's flat as a board. And here we are going 600 mot, uh, knots plus, and they have these volcanic plugs that just rise out of the deserts up there, hundreds of feet tall. And he's aiming right for one of those things, and you're sitting there watching that thing just getting <laughs> big, bigger and bigger in your windscreen. And you're just about ready to say, oh, is this, you know, it's <laughs> just at the, what seems like the last second, the nose pitches up, that thing just flies over, dies back down the other side, levels off. It was awesome. Just absolutely awesome to, to see that. Now, did it have... I, uh, by, by the way, I'm, I'm going to have to bail here. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, were, we got through all the questions, though. That was everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have one more, uh, shoot oh, it. Did the, the F-111 have a stick on the right, like the Phantom had yes. one on the back? Oh, the, okay. So you, you yeah. could find it. Yeah, the the uh, the version I I don't know if the opera well the versions that I was flying all had full controls on the uh, right side uh, and in the back the F four had uh, excuse me the Air Force had a, had a habit of doing that of making sure in two place airplanes they provided a full set of controls at each position the Navy as I understand I don't think in the back of their F four I've been told they don't uh, they did not have uh, flight controls back there. That, that, that's my understanding. My, my flight instructor had been a Navy NFO and uh, he was like, nope. And he had ejection also, by the way, uh, they yeah. caught fire going off the carrier and punched right oh, out. But, yeah. That'll do it. Yeah. Well, Mike, I cannot thank you enough for coming on my humble little show and doing yeah. this. It's been great. I'm glad to do it. Any, anybody wants to talk aviation or space, it's always, <laughs> fun, always fun to do, but I, uh, 
I hope everybody uh, enjoys the program and um, I wish you all the very, very best of luck and stay safe in this COVID. Once again, thank you. And I'll see if I can't get this up this evening. Okay, I'll great. You link once it's up. All right. Well, I'm going to bail and uh, okay. I really, uh, really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. It was great fun. But, thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll stay in touch too. Uh, Absolutely. I'm yeah. available. <laughs> okay. All right. That's for, for Zooms or chats or whatever. Well, you take my wife, my wife definitely says I'm not available. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I got to run. I got another one coming up here. So I got to bail on this, but uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Because you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I ain't commercial crew. But I can launch it, launch it like I'm supposed to do. Cause I got that boom, boom that all the astros chase. All the space flight to all the right places. I see Orion crew working that ship nonstop. You know we're going far. Now put that last on top. If you got boosters, boosters, just raise them up. Cause every spacecraft needs propulsion from the bottom to the top. Hey, they're working so hard. Don't you love these NASA guys? They will take us so far the first time that Orion flies. Traveling to deep destinations for too long So if that's what you're into, then join in and ride along Because you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel I'm all about that space, about that space I'm bringing rockets back Go ahead and tell the whole world that Come on board, it's that Cause every spacecraft needs propulsion From the bottom to the top Hey, they're working so hard Don't you love these NASA guys? They will take us so far The first time that Orion flies Traveling to deep destinations for too long So if that's what you're into, then join in and ride along Because you know I'm all about that space, about that space Space travel I'm all about that space, Woo! about that space You know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I said I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I said I'm all about that space, about that space, because you know I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I said I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel. I'm all about that space, about that space, space travel.